I'm Amanda Leitner, and welcome to Rochester Rising, where we amplify the stories of Rochester entrepreneurs. Welcome to episode 187 of the podcast today. So today on the podcast, I had the immense pleasure of sharing a conversation I had with two amazing female venture capitalists, Mary Grove and Pam York. Both of these women and their venture firms are based in Minneapolis. Mary Grove is one of the managing partners of the brand new firm, Bread and Butter Ventures. On the podcast today, she talks about how she learned about grit and hustle from her parents, who are immigrants from Thailand. She talks about how she went to grad school at Stanford and in 2004 started at Google, where at Google, she began the team that's now Google for Startups, which is the company's umbrella for supporting startups and entrepreneurial ecosystems. In 2018, Mary moved from the Bay Area to Minnesota with her husband and twins. For two years, she worked for Revolution, which is a firm founded by Steve Case and was an investment partner on the Rise of the Rest Seed Fund and led about 25 investments. Today, she's fully dedicated to invest in the early startup space, primarily at the seed stage with her brand new firm, Bread and Butter Ventures. Pam York is a founding general partner of Capita 3, which is an early stage venture capital group also headquartered in Minneapolis. Capita 3 invests in early stage companies led by women and diverse teams in healthcare. Pam has a PhD in electrical engineering, but really found her love for business when she worked in a venture-backed company with a $100 million research and development budget. While at that company, she helped to incubate teams and technologies and spin out multiple companies and really began to understand the intersection of technology, business, and finance. Her experience has primarily been in high-tech, venture-backed STEM companies. She started doing her own angel investing, and her first investment had a very strong IPO. She moved to Minneapolis with her now husband in 2011 and has a strong passion for investing in women. So stick around for this full podcast today. It's an amazing conversation with Pam and Mary. We talk about venture capital and how it fits in with other types of financing. We talk about how venture capital funds work and the typical life cycle of a fund. We discuss where Capita 3 and Bread and Butter Ventures focus their investments in terms of industry and geography, and we discuss what makes a good portfolio company for these two investment firms, among with many other things. So stay tuned today for a fantastic discussion about venture capital with Mary Grove and Pam York. Rochester Rising serves as the storytelling arm of Collider, which is a Rochester-based nonprofit that supports Rochester entrepreneurs through events, education, space, and storytelling. Rochester Rising also has a brand new podcast out called Ecosystem North. Whereas on Rochester Rising, we talk about entrepreneurs, on Ecosystem North, we talk with entrepreneurial ecosystem builders and understanding their passion for helping entrepreneurs succeed. New episodes come out every Friday, so check it out. You can subscribe to Ecosystem North on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, and also you can check it out on our website at rochesterrising.org. New episodes come out every Friday. All right, so now on to the podcast today with Mary Grove and Pam York. Yeah, thanks so much, Mary and Pam, for being here today. I appreciate your time and and joining via Zoom. Um, But I just wanted to start by having both of you ladies introduce yourselves um, and give a little bit of your background and how you got to where you are uh, today. Sure. Mary, go for it. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Amanda, for having us. It's really great to be here and super excited for the conversation. So quick introduction from me. So I'm Mary Grove. I'm one of the managing partners of Bread and Butter Ventures, which is a new firm we just uh, announced here last month. So excited to talk more about that. But my path into venture capital uh, began in the tech industry, really. So just to back up and give a little bit more context. So my, my parents... Uh, were immigrants from Thailand who came here, you know, started and ran small businesses together for over 30 years. And so I feel so blessed and privileged to have grown up with both 
the immigrant family lens, but also the entrepreneurial lens of what what grit and hustle it takes to, you know, both fail and succeed in in new ventures. And um, I did my undergraduate and graduate school at Stanford in the in the backyard of tech, and I I sort of I accidentally stumbled into the tech industry, but I ended up starting at Google back in 2004 on the IPO deal team the year we went public. I spent the next six years in early stage product and business development. And then my last six years, I started the team that's that's now Google for Startups, which is the company's umbrella for supporting both startups, but also entrepreneurial ecosystems in about 130 countries. And so there I honed my, you know, my deep love for working with startups, but particularly at the early stage and, and also particularly outside of Silicon Valley. And so fast forward to 2018. My family and I moved from the Bay Area here to Minnesota. So I live in Minneapolis now with my husband and our three-year-old twins. And it's been a big life um, life adventure. And so I spent the last two years as an investment partner at Revolution, which is a, a firm based in Washington, D.C., founded by Steve Case. I was an investment partner on the Rise of the Rest Seed Fund. So really worked across uh, many sectors from the early stage. But there I led about 25 investments in different industries, but in particular, healthcare, enterprise software, future of work, uh, prop tech was another big one. And so learn that there is so much opportunity, talent here on the ground in the Midwest specifically, and decided to take the, the plunge to really go all in on our ecosystem. And I you know, deeply wanna be a part of and invest in and from the community where I live today. So that's the genesis behind uh, bread and butter ventures, which I'm happy to share more about. But basically, I'm I'm fully dedicated now to continuing to to invest in early stage companies, primarily at the seed stage. Great, I'm Pam York, and I've known uh, Amanda for quite a while in <laughs> one realm, and Mary, I've known you for a while in another realm, and so it's really a delight to be here. Um, talking to both of you. So I am a founding general partner of Capita3. We are an early stage venture capital group headquartered in Minneapolis. And we we invest in early stage companies that are led by women and diverse teams and innovating in health and healthcare. And how I got here, like Mary, you know, it sounds like your path was a bit circuitous and so was mine. I, I grew up in a family where I had no exposure, I mean, no exposure at all to business. My mom was a nurse, you know, my dad was a science teacher. And so I was good in math and science and I got vectored into engineering um, in school and I went on to get a PhD in electrical engineering. Um, but then I got, um, and I and I loved math and science, but I had no exposure to business, which I eventually discovered was kind of my true love. But I, I got hired into this company that was really interesting. It was a hundred million dollar kind of R and D group that got spun out of General Electric. And this is years ago, and given two hundred million dollars in five years to build a sustainable model. So I hadn't really thought about that until today when I was thinking about you know, how did I get to venture capital? But my very first job straight out of getting my PhD was in sort of this kind of bizarre venture backed company that was filled with, it's like a thousand people, 60% were scientists and engineers and, and had a hundred million dollar R and D budget with this mandate to figure out how to be sustainable. And, you know, long story short, we wound up creating this business model where we incubated teams and technologies and spun out a whole bunch of companies so I went from being a, you know, a PhD doubly doing, you know, more D than R, you know, we were really doing product development to being part of a couple of different startup companies as a founder first in a technical role, and then um, in an executive management role and, and, you know, raising financing from both East Coast and West Coast VCs for those companies. So I really, that's where I started to really realize this intersection of technology and innovation and business and finance was to me just like the most exciting thing I could imagine. And I almost went to, um, I almost went back and got an executive MBA. I started at Wharton actually, but um, then I had an opportunity to, you know, I found my first company and thought that would be a better experience than spending my time getting an MBA. So, so I, I did that. And uh Everything that I've been involved in in terms of forming companies has been high tech venture capital backed, you know, sort of STEM based companies, um, all technology commercialization focused. Um, and uh, and then I started doing my own investing. And back when you could you could borrow from your 401k 
of <laughs> savings and use it however you wanted. I actually made my first angel investment into a company that had wound up having a blockbuster IPO. And so the kind of the, the confluence of all those factors really made me realize that I, a long time ago that I really wanted to be in venture capital. It's just, it's just taken a while to kind of find my way here. And like you, Mary, I moved to Minneapolis, um, uh, to be with, uh, you know, my now husband, and I've been here since 2011. And I really didn't anticipate focusing on investing in women. But you know, we can talk more about that as we get into the podcast. But that's, um, that's a huge passion of mine um, right now. So that's, that's, that's my path a little strange and windy, but uh, really happy to be here investing in companies. I feel everyone's I think there's yeah, I don't think there's anyone in VC who says who's a, there's no linear path, I think, is the is the answer. <laughs> no, I don't think in anything. Um, but I think that sets the conversation up really nice. And I wanted to kind of get everyone on a level playing field, too, about what exactly venture capital is. So if we can take a few moments before we jump in. So what is venture capital, you know, and how does it fit in with other types of funding, such as, you know, I feel like a lot of people are familiar with bootstrapping, but then angel investing and even kind of bankable businesses. Where does venture capital fit into that whole picture? Sure, I'm happy to jump in on that, Amanda. Um, so if you start with bootstrapping, I mean, it's an example of you're taking your own money or revenues from the business and you're using that to grow the business. And that makes sense when the business is cash flowing. Um, and so you can think of businesses where, uh, you know, if it's if it is perhaps a restaurant or if it's an accounting business um, where there's some revenue coming in from existing customer base and then you're using some of that to grow the company. Um, when you move into the realm of angel and venture capital financing, these are what we call high growth companies. Oftentimes there isn't any cash flow in the beginning um, because the company's building products and services on new technologies that have to be proven out. Um, and so, uh, so that requires an infusion of cash, which um, sometimes the founders can invest some of their own money from, you know, say friends and family. Um, but it often is a level of cash, hundreds of thousands to millions of many, many millions of dollars that most founders don't, you know, sort of have uh, themselves. And so they raise that money from other people. Often it starts with raising money from angel investors, which are just individuals that are high net within high net worth that want to invest some of their own money into companies. Um, and then where venture capital fits on that spectrum, because it does can start very early in a company's life cycle, but the difference is an angel investor is investing their own money for their own purposes, their own criteria. A venture capital firm has raised money from other people. Um, oftentimes, if it's a large enough fund, it's from institutions who have a fiduciary responsibility to their stakeholders to make money. And so then they're investing in a venture capital firm that has a fiduciary responsibility to produce an ROI for its investors, often called, called LPs. And that's where it becomes professionally managed money. Um, venture capital is, is called, you know, sort of professional, professional, professionally managed investment vehicle. So I'll stop there and let Mary add to that. No, oh, that was a super comprehensive summary. I think that the things I would add there are from the entrepreneur's perspective. It's it's a really important question to ask yourself: What type of business am I building? What is my long term vision here? And then, therefore, what is the best way to finance this business? And that goes to Amanda. You know, the themes that you addressed. Maybe this is a a small business loan until I get cash flow positive and the cash is flowing in the business. Maybe this is a, an intergenerational family business that I want to pass on to my children and to their children. And so in that case, would a, you know, venture is not the right way to finance that because venture capital is expecting a, a return on that investment. And so typically when, when companies take VC money, you know, the investors are looking for an exit event or a liquidity event, meaning either the company gets acquired or the company goes public and they can return that capital in a span of seven years, plus or minus, you know, give or take there, but we're not talking about 30 years. We're not talking about two years either. And so when you look at the, the life cycle of venture capital, you typically have that, what we call friends and family money, whether or not they're your actual friends and family, people who are your first individuals, who are your first small checks in to prove the concept. And then you swim upstream a bit to that angel 
investment. And then in the span of VC, we've got everything from, you know, pre-seed, seed, series A, B, C, and so on. So when you hear these terms tossed around in venture capital, like, oh, we're, we're, we're at the, at the, at the B stage. Like, what does it mean? It's sort of that, that gradual ramp up. Yeah. Thank you for that. I think that was a great explanation. I feel like, you know, as kind of an entrepreneurial ecosystem builder, one of the hardest conversations that we have to have with people is when they say, oh, we're look, we seeking investors, but it's like you were both saying, you know, it's, thinking about what the life cycle of that is, is it going to have, what's the return on investment going to be? And those are really hard conversations to have. And I don't know if it's just kind of the nomenclature is not quite understood of what an investor is. Um, But based on what you're saying, if it's something like a restaurant or let's say even an agricultural business that might not be cash flowing, but it'll probably be cash flowing in like two years, you'd suggest go to friends and family, try a bank loan for something like that. That wouldn't be a tenfold return on investment. Well, I think that the word investor is a broad word, rightfully so. So even, even a business like a restaurant needs investors, but typically they're not venture venture capital investors. They're, you know, individual individuals or, or groups who invest specifically in that industry. You know, most restaurants are, are not self-funded by the, the sole owner. It's, so I think, you know, seeking investment is a, is a perfectly acceptable term. It's, it's when you're seeking venture capital investment. I think that, you know, Silicon Valley has a bit glorified the idea of a, a venture-backed company so that if, if I'm starting a new venture, you know, I need to be venture-backed. But that is 100% not the case, you know, in my view. It, it's really, what's the best form of capitalization for the business that you're building? And you can be the best in the world at, at that business with that form of funding behind you. So it really is a very small subset of companies who, who fit that category. But for those that do, that's absolutely the right path. Yeah, and I would say, Amanda, I mean, a vast majority of the companies in this or businesses in this country are small businesses. And the two key measures are cash flow and scale. And so a, a company, if you can, the, the, the calculation is, can you expect to have the cash flow in the relatively near future for banks to probably be within a few months or a year if you've got signed contracts, probably not a year, maybe six months. If you can service the debt, on the money that you're, you know, that you're borrowing, then that's, you know, debt financing works and also um, scale, meaning, you know, say you're going to generate 10 million annual recurring revenues with 25 people. And that's, that's the kind of the top of where your business, which it would be an awesome business, right? Um, But it's venture financeable companies typically are addressing billion dollar, not always, but oftentimes a billion dollar market and need to scale in order to really address that market. So maybe that's hopefully that's helpful in explaining to people these. It's not about it's it's kind of these are sort of universal factors. It's not about the person or the business. Right. Absolutely. Um, And I, I wanted to ask you, ladies, too, you know, when people when entrepreneurs, startups are coming to you, kind of what stage in business development are they? And then at what point should they start having that conversation with you? Well, for us, we, because we're, you know, we made the commitment very early on when we formed Capita 3 that we would meet with female founders kind of regardless of where they were in their life cycle, just because we, We wanted to be um, a firm that would raise the flag and say, we're here to help you. Um, You know, as we grow and as our deal flow grows, it gets harder and harder to do that because it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. But we like to talk to firms very early that look like, you know, it could be at the launch stage. Um, but when they look like they might meet our criteria in the future, we'd like to see, you know, we would love to talk to them early on so that we can help them and, um, you know, and then know them by the time they're ready for investment. But we often are meeting with companies. We invest in seed stage. So that's, you know, it's pre-seed, seed, series A. So that's the earlier side of venture capital investing. Um, so we often see companies wh- when they're doing a round of financing as well. So it kind of spans a spectrum of of time frames. And for us, you know, I didn't really introduce bread and butter much, but so bread and butter ventures, you know, first of all, how we arrived at the name is, is one of Minnesota's many nicknames is the bread and butter state, given our, our, how well-known we are for our excellence in flour products and and dairy products. Uh, But our, our play on that is that we want to invest. So we're, we are 
able to and, and like to look across all sectors, but we really want to lean heavily into to the big three that we think are the backbone sectors of the modern economy, but also map extremely closely to the sectors where Minnesota excels. And that includes, you know, food and ag tech as the first, health tech as the second, and enterprise software as the third. And so in, within those categories, you know, in ag tech, for example, we are home to the world's five, five largest food companies are based here in Minnesota, Cargill, Ecolab, you name it. Um, in healthcare, you know, unparalleled access to resources like Mayo Clinic, United Health Group. On the enterprise side, broadly, you know, we boast the highest number of Fortune 500s per capita in the nation at 16 Fortune 500s. And so our thesis is all about, could we invest in the best teams, no matter where they are globally, uh, where we can specifically lean in with this Minnesota layer of infrastructure to help connect them back into industry, into pilot opportunities, into mentorship, and ultimately, we hope long-term, you know, path to M&A, because that is a, a part of the virtuous cycle of any startup ecosystem. And so our, our focus is, you know, similar to PAMS at Capita 3, is, is really that early stage. And that means to us pre-seed and seed. And that could be, you know, typically the rounds that companies are raising are anywhere between $500,000 to about $3 million in that range. So I met with, you know, three different startups today, for example, one that's doing uh, 750K a year in revenue, one that's doing 2 million in monthly revenue because they just launched their first pilot. And I think both are really strong candidates for potential investment. And so it really does span uh, the range, but, but we suggest, you know, as long as soon as you have a live product that you that you feel is validated in some way, whether that's because of the usage data post-launch or you've talked to 10 target customers who are want to sign with you, you know, start having those conversations and at least get, get some early feedback. So all that I know about venture capital basically has come from Brad Feld's book, Venture Deals. <laughs> Which is amazing. You, know, <laughs> you don't really... And it works differently than other things because like we were talking about, you know, angel investment, it's normally, you know, an individual's investment. But when you're looking at venture, it's this fund and, and you're accountable to people as well who have invested into that fund. Um, so can you both talk a little bit about, you know, how the fund works, um, how that money gets into it? And then I believe it has a life cycle, too. So you raise one, you invest it, and then you look at raising for another fund, right? Yes. Yeah. Did you want to go take that, Mary? Sure. <clears throat> so uh, the question is more just the mechanics of a fund and how the life cycle works. Yes. Yep. Yep. So, you know, our, our process as fund managers or people who, who run funds is actually very similar to the process of a startup, right? We are out there pitching our, our thesis, our vision, our value proposition, how we can differentiate from you know, all the firms that are that are popping up left and right, investing in our sectors. And so we are putting together our exact pitch the same way that a startup is. And so we pitch a group of <clears throat> limited partners or LPs as they're called for short. And that can range from any anyone from, you know, a high net worth individual who's putting in their own capital to the largest institutions, which can include things like, you know, state pension funds, corporations, uh, other large funds who have fund to fund programs. So the money can really come from anywhere as a fund manager, it's important to think about you know, who do you want, um, who do you want to take capital from, who do you want around your table, who do you want around your team? Because ultimately, you do answer to them from a from a financial perspective, right? So we take their capital, and then we have our fund. Um, within that, we, we've got usually the investment team includes what we call general partners or GPs. So we've got the LPs and the GPs, and those are the people who are responsible for running the fund. We also build out you know, teams, and, and that's all a function of how much capital do you have under management, therefore how much do you have in management fees to fund your operations, and it's it's really running a business um, off this capital that you've convinced people to for you to be the steward of, and so within that, you have, you know, all sorts of different roles. I think one of the big trends right now in, in venture capital is this notion of platform or platform team. How do we add value post-investment beyond the dollar? How do we think about community and ecosystem engagement, which is a really cool trend that I'm that I'm a huge fan of. Um, and while it can vary, the average profile of a fund is, you know, we're pitching a 10-year fund life. So a 10-year period. Typically, you see a six-year investment period, meaning we are going to invest your capital over a six-year period. 
And then you can expect to see your returns, you know, based on that timeline. But mechanically, you know, how, how we think about it is we will probably invest in the entire, the full number of companies, new investments we will make within the first, let's say, half of that six-year period. And the rest will reserve for what we call follow-on or, you know, putting additional money into future rounds that, that company raises. So if we're investing at the seed stage, it's saving some capital for their series A, maybe their series B, helping them fundraise with other firms we work with um, beyond that. And so that's typically what we, what we pitch. And then as you alluded to, Amanda, you know, you don't wait till that six, that 10 years are up or even the six years, as soon as you feel like you're getting close to finishing with that first number of companies for first checks, then you start on the nice treadmill of, of doing it again. And so um, it really does though. It, it keeps, it, I think it keeps VCs humble because, you know, we certainly feel extremely privileged that, you know, entrepreneurs choose to work with us and choose to take our capital. And it is a long-term relationship. It's not transactional. It's who do you want to call at 11 PM when things are going really South? Who do you want to talk to on a Sunday night before a board meeting? And it it really is about, um, I think, founder investor fit just as much as, as anything. And so those are all critical decisions for, for all of us, but I love that the, you know, we have to be out there dialing for dollars as well. And it keeps us very humble about what, what the experience is like for, the entrepreneur on the other side of the table. Yeah, that's a great explanation, Mary. I I, I love the analogy too. Um, it's like it's like a startup, you know. It's and there's all different kinds of verticals for venture funds and investment theses, and and maybe just another word about how how we're expected to work with our portfolio companies. It really varies by stage of fund and appetite of the partners and sort of their skill set. But certainly in early stage venture funds that like Mary and I are in, there's an expectation that you will bring a skill set to help those companies. Um, so, uh, uh, which might mean sitting on their board, it might mean making introductions to, to whether it's new hires or other investors, or strategic partners. So there's some, some kind of value add as Mary described it. Um, and that really varies by firms. And you hear more about more operationally focused VCs. Um, so Mary and I both have operational backgrounds. And so we bring that sort of skill set of helping the companies because we understand how to build companies. And then there's others that have more of a finance background and, and really understand more about the deal structure. So it's one of the key aspects of if you want to raise a venture fund, what is your skill set? And then how does your thesis reinforce your skill set and the team that you're building? And then maybe just another comment about the sizes of funds, because I know that's something that's really people are really curious about. So there's um, there's early stage investors, mid stage and late stage over this whole life cycle of the company, which ma- it's designed to match the life cycle of the company from launch to exit. And then there's also sizes of funds. And um, so there's nano funds, which are under 10 million. And then there's micro funds, which are like up to 100 million and then everything else beyond that. So mid-sized funds, typically 200 to 600 million. And then of course we've heard of the, you know, the Andreessen Horowitzes of the world, which have many billions of dollars um, in capital under management. And as you become a much larger fund, obviously you got to write bigger checks um, because otherwise you're, you know, you can't invest a billion dollars easily, $1 million at a time. So they naturally, as the funds get larger, they naturally move to, you know, bigger check sizes and often to later stages. And so these early stage funds are often smaller funds, you know, commensurate with um, the check size, but also oftentimes early stage fund managers are relatively new. So it can be hard to raise a large amount of capital as a new fund manager. Yeah, I think that's a good interesting thing to talk about too. Like you were saying, uh, Mary and Pam, you know, this is a very entrepreneurial endeavor and, you know, a, a newer fund, you know, you're going out and maybe raising things for the first time as a venture capitalist. So what was kind of your experience like doing that? How did you prepare for that? And what's that kind of journey been like as a venture capital entrepreneur? <laughs> Well, I'll just say for me, uh, back in, we started Capita 3 back in 2015 is when we really started doing the research um, because we were hearing from a lot of our male colleagues, you know, 
we go to these events and there wouldn't be very many women startup, women led startups. And, and we would ask our male colleagues about it and they would say, well, there aren't very many women led startups. So they're not very good or we don't know where they are. And so we kept hearing all this anecdotal information and we started doing research around, well, what's really happening? What's actually really happening out there? And then we formed this view that there's really, um, while the deal flow isn't as high for male-led companies, there's really awesome companies led by women with very good ROI, and it's just a matter of, of finding them. And so that was the conclusion that we came to, which is a foregone, I mean, this is, people recognize this now, and lots and lots and lots of venture funds have been raised on that thesis since then. But back in 2015, 2016, it wasn't, it was not a comfortable thing to talk about, to be honest. Um, and you know, it was, we had to become people who could talk about that in a way that really demonstrated the opportunity as opposed to complaining about the gap. And we made a conscious decision in all of our fundraising, we're going to be people taking action, making a difference, um, versus complaining about the fact that not very much capital is going to women, um, and so that took some growth on our part, but also it took a lot of education. We had to educate, and we, we raised our fund. I mean, our fund is teeny, we're a nano, nano fund, it's 1.2 million. We started with 30 million, but back then it was just this whole gender lens, you know, women led um, venture fund was very new. And so it was a bold thing that we were doing, but it was also very uncomfortable. And so we chose to kind of back off and do something small that we knew we could get done in just a few months amongst our network. So we wound up raising our fund all, almost all from individuals in one inst institution, um, just because we felt that the hurdle of getting individuals to say yes on this new thesis, you know, new fund managers, new investment thesis, gender lens, lens investing, you know, even investing in health at that time was, wasn't new, but it wasn't as understood as it is now. Um, so it required a lot of education and um, a lot of meetings to, to raise the fund, which is still the case. Uh, but um, I think our thesis is better understood now. Absolutely. I mean, Pam was one of the as she said, the early pioneers, you know, behind what is now a huge cultural zeitgeist conversation in venture capital about, you know, equity across the board. But it's been uh, really heartening, I think, to see the the additional people raising their hands to say we want to get involved. And whether that's, you know, direct investment in startups or we're, you know, I think a perfectly uh, optimal outcome is for, for those who are interested but don't want to do the direct invest in management to, to become LPs, right, where you can. And I think it's about lowering, uh, de demystifying the barriers around venture capital. One of the reasons I'm so grateful for this, this podcast and this conversation, it's how do we mobilize more people to become, who, who are interested and able to become limited partners in these funds, more people are interested in becoming investors at these funds to change the face of what these teams look like. And so, yeah, just a huge kudos to Pam for her pioneering there. Thanks, Mary. Have either of you read the book? I think it just came out this year. Um, it's about damn time by Arlen Hamilton. <laughs> I haven't I haven't read it yet. I really want to. I'm a big uh, big uh, fan of Arlen. We worked together back when I was running Google for entrepreneurs, and we've we've co-invested in a, a company together. And she's I, I've heard I can't wait to read the book, but I've heard really good things about it. Yeah, it's just so amazing. You know, again, seeing a space that didn't have people like you, you know, as, you know, she's a um, woman, African-American and gay, you know, there were no <laughs> venture capitalists like that. Um, so, you know, that's a lot of work. And she talked about it, which is just, it was really, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Amanda, I think one other thing that's really worth mentioning is that, um, and I think it's very relevant for what's happening right now. We, purposefully spent a lot of our time educating women because there's there's like 5 million women in this country that um, could qualify as angel investors. It's probably more than that now, but you know, there's many, many millions of women that could become angel investors or limited partners in venture funds. And they just don't know it. You know, they just don't realize that there's this opportunity for whatever reason, they're not connected to those networks. And um, I think it's the same thing for African American people. It's it's and you know people of color and a whole diverse set of of potential LPs out there. Just really bringing this message to them: you can be part of a venture fund. These smaller, you know, early stage venture fund um, 
getting those people involved, I think would be, you know, is a phenomenal thing we can do. Absolutely. I wanted to ask you both too, we mentioned this a little bit, um, but your both your, your firms are investing now from what I understand. Um, and we talked a little about what type of industry are you both mainly focused on Minnesota, the Midwest, or is it, you know, looking for opportunities across um, the U S do you want to go ahead? Go ahead, Pam. Oh, sure. Sure. For Capita three, um, when we started the fund, you know, we heard a lot of concerns about deal flow and we really wanted to focus in the Midwest um, but because a lot of our investors were worried that deal flow wouldn't be big enough in the Midwest for, you know, if you take a slice of it's got to be a woman CEO and then it's in healthcare and then it's early stage. Um, so we decided from the start to invest U.S. wide. Um, and, you know, we're seeing a lot of deal flow from the coast, as you would expect, because that's where many large centers of um, you know, startup and venture capital activity exists. Um, but we also, we, we really want to invest in the Midwest. We do have one investment um, in the Midwest. It's out of, uh, it's a spin out of Mayo Clinic actually. Um, but uh, so we're looking actively in the Midwest, um, but we do source deals uh, US wide. And then with Bread and Butter Ventures, and I should mention, so my, my partner is Brett Broll, who, is you know such a such an expert in food tech and ag tech and he's he also runs the Techstars farm to fork program but independently he had been running his own fund for the last four years called the syndicate fund so when we joined forces to form bread and butter um so we essentially moved the syndicate fund investments over to become bread and butter portfolio companies as we now make new investments out of our out of our new fund and so um from a portfolio what we've inherited uh, with great pride, you know, we have about 30, we have 32 investments in that portfolio. Uh, eight of them, so a quarter of them are, are based in Minnesota, but that's not a requirement. So we're, we're actually able to, and, and can and do invest globally. We've got a, number, a handful of companies outside the US. But I think the biggest question that we ask ourselves is, are we, are, again, are we as a firm uniquely equipped to add value to this company? So if it's an enterprise software company, in Barcelona versus one in Indianapolis. You know, I, I don't know. We, we have to, there has to be something special that we can do to provide that value versus the, the proximal value that we could provide. So, um, but right now we're, we're really excited. We just closed three investments um, in the last week. We announced one today, a new one in, in a company called Omnia Fishing, which is an e-commerce platform for, for anglers and they're, they're Minnesota based. But we've seen, you know, the deal flow that we've seen in the past week has been from, you know, from Singapore to San Francisco, to Dallas, to Boston, to Chicago, to, to Minnesota. So it, it's exciting to see what's possible, but, but I am excited about, I think it's no, it's no accident that, you know, 25% of the current companies are in Minnesota because our, our goal, given we are a generalist fund too, is to be that front door to the local ecosystem. And we want to meet with and know every early stage company here, because if it's not a fit for us, for whatever reason, we want to help make introductions. And so every member of our team does open office hours every week where anybody uh, anywhere can sign up to meet with us, but it could be, you could pitch us a company, you could talk about college applications, like anything that you want to talk about. And so I think it's about, again, demystifying this, the front door into venture that today is all about, do I have a warm intro? You know, you, you can never find, you can't even necessarily find the team on, on the, the, the VC firm's website, much less reach them. And so that's a, an interesting, you know, we, we want to double down on that, that transparency and openness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's so important because it is just like a really intimidating thing to, to reach out to a venture capitalist, especially if you don't know anything about it. And then you tend to just not want to engage with it. Um, if it's, you know, this mystical thing. Um, hey Amanda, can I, I wanted to mention one thing because Mary's very humble. Um, and so, <laughs> so you know, in addition to, Mary's made herself super available ever since she moved back to Minnesota. So she, you know, we both really mean it when we say we're available to meet. But the other thing I wanted to point out was um, that Mary has spearheaded, uh, because it, it, once you become a venture investor, lots and lots of people find you and want to meet with you. And, you know, then it gets hard to do your day job. And so part of what we need to do is really provide resources for companies to really help them. 
and um, versus meeting one on one on one and educating each person in the same way over and over. So Mary's really spearheaded the development of a number of resources, educational programs, really targeted for early stage founders um, that are being provided online. And I don't know, Mary, if you want to mention you know, what's coming up next or anything about that. Just That's go. a great reminder, Pam. Now that, now that you mentioned it, like we're about due for one. <laughs> yeah, so we, exactly. So through, um, through partnership with Greater MSP and Forge North, we are making available, we, we being, you know, the active venture investors in the Minnesota ecosystem, we're, it's not a huge list. And so we're all pretty, pretty close and uh, work very closely with each other. So we've gotten together and said, you know, we're all in on trying to push forward with this education agenda that's both for aspiring or current entrepreneurs, but also for aspiring or current angel investors to Pam's earlier point about mobilizing more capital off the sidelines. And so we're, we're hosting right now, it's quarterly, a free session that's, uh, that's made available online live. So you can tune in and ask questions in real time, but then we record that and upload it after. And so, you know, the, the first one was fundraising faster, kind of geared towards startups, the next one is um, was a, a download on you know taking corporate venture capital versus traditional venture capital, and and in all seriousness, we are about due for one, so expect one to, to pop up here in the next uh, one to two months. Well, and Amanda, you probably know of um, the Home Center does the NSF um, ICORS value proposition design, which is now offered online um, and uh, to, uh, statewide. So it's first. It's for, you don't, you no longer have to be faculty or staff to participate in those. So more for the STEM innovators and founders, that's a really great program too. Awesome. And where's the best place, Mary, to know when this programming is coming out? So I would go to the Forge North, the Forge North blog, which is part of, you just search for Forge North Greater MSP. They've got a blog and, and they've been super helpful in uh, playing a huge role in bringing the investment community together regularly, helping us convene and helping us, you know, seamlessly execute a lot of the technology behind these things on the back end. So they're the best channel to promote. And then afterwards, we also share the the recorded videos through their, their channel as well. It's been, if there's been one thing that's been very positive about this time, I think it's access to information. Um, it's like you were saying, you were recording this live, but if you're not um, free during that time, you can access it, you know, at 10 p.m. when you're ready to go to sleep and, you know, the kids are asleep and, you know, that's the time that you have to do it. So, and we'll, and, put, we'll yeah. put you to sleep with our session. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not. Sometimes that's the best time to like, you're relaxed. There's no distractions. You can just like focus in. Um, but yeah, I think it just opens up so many possibilities when you're not like physically here or even in Rochester going up to something in Minneapolis sometimes can be, I mean, that's your day you know, <laughs> I, I know I was early on in the, in the stay at home. Um, I was wondering, I was worried that we kept, we we're hosting all these events and I was worried would people tune in because, or does everybody have zoom fatigue? But I think the opposite has been true. You know, I was in a, uh, a pitch competition last month that had 900 users tuned in from around the world. And that's the other thing, right? You, you hosted an event before that was hyper local in your market. And now yeah. it literally, I love, love the accessibility. And I hope that when we are able to return to a, a more normal semblance of reality, that we can still have that open access for everyone. Yeah. yeah. I'm impressed a platform can handle 900 participants, but I don't know what they were. It wasn't one of the ones that I'd used before. I forget the name, but it was impressive. <laughs> so I would imagine you know, being a venture capitalist, doing what you're doing is very emotionally kind of consuming um, because not only are you an entrepreneur managing this fund, you're, you're assisting entrepreneurs, you know, pursuing their dreams and their paths, but what kind of drives you to do this and what's one of your favorite parts of doing um, what you're doing with, with bread and butter and with, with Capita 3? Well, I'll just say for me, I, um, I mean, I, I love every single solitary part of this. I, I love fundraising. I love managing the fund. I love making investments. I love working with companies. So it's not hard for me to get energy from this. Um, the one place that I, where I get drained is when you're trying to work with a founder who won't listen to you. <laughs> We all have that experience, but you know, we try to invest in people and people to, that listen, but you know, early on when we formed Capita 3, we sort of 
joked about this mission of rebalancing the world by the way women are wired. And um, it's not really a joke. It's really kind of how I feel in my, in my heart that um, we, we need a world that's more balanced in terms of who, uh, who receives capital, who's in leadership positions. And in having that balance, whether it's gender, whether it's race, whether it's your opinion, the vertical, we, it, you know, we could talk for hours about why that matters, but I think we all kind of know that that matters. And so investing in women-led companies and seeing them just thrive under the support that we provide them both you know both uh value added support as well as dollars um really it, that's why i'm doing this because i want to see many many more women succeed and i also want to um you know really see us transform human health into a place where we can genuinely get out in front of the disease state and heal and be healthy so i feel unbelievably blessed to be able to do something that, you know, that fires on so many cylinders that just kind of drive me as, as a human being. That's so beautiful. Like how to follow that. I, I would say that I, you know, similarly, I believe that the opportunity to back entrepreneurs is just, is the opportunity of our lifetime, the ability to transform their companies, their communities, their cities, ultimately the world. And I, you know, my background is in big corporate. My husband works in state government, but I really believe that actually a bulk of our transformative innovation is going to come from startups and not necessarily those two, those other two very large components of any ecosystem. And so I don't know, it's such, it's such an honor and a delight and a privilege to do this work. It is so intellectually stimulating to look across all these sectors in any given day, it's, you know, it's affordable housing, it's a maternal healthcare company, it's a company looking at supply chain manufacturing, it's clean tech, and it's, it's constantly stretches, uh, stretches me and my, where my, my intellectual uh, capabilities. And I also just, the part I love the most is working with the company's post-investment. And that's a true partnership, long-term, good, bad, ugly, phenomenal. We want to be instrumental and, and really feel a sense of, you know, we're on the team, we work for them as well as they've taken capital from us. And so it's, uh, it's insanely fun. It's intoxicating. And it's also, um, it is hard work because, and I don't, I don't much separate my intellectual from my emotional commitment. And so my commitment to the, our companies is always like hundred percent all in. And, you know, it's hard, it's hard sometimes, right. When you have to make a rational, logical decision, but, but with your heart as well. And I think it can lead to uh, the best outcome when we, think about things holistically. So yeah, it's, it's truly, it's a remarkable privilege. And I hope that we can continue to open up the network of venture for who, who gets to sit in these seats and who gets to make investment decisions and who gets to be a part of supporting these teams. Mm -hmm. Amanda, maybe one other thing to add to that, because Mary is, is investing across several verticals. And I think that's another thing, which I'm, I, I kind of miss doing that because we're very focused on here. So that's another factor for a person to think about by investing across all these verticals, you get this perspective on what's happening in the world that I think is really super valuable. And it's also very interesting, but then also focusing on a particular vertical, you can sort of, you know, double down on that area. So there's pros and cons to that. And it's really, it, it really is a personal preference. Um, and, uh, but both kinds of funds can get funded. Um, and the other thing is, is that I don't know how it is for you, Mary, but I don't, I don't stay awake at night worrying about producing ROI for my investors. I'm just so, so super confident that we're going to, and you know, we will, or we won't. Right. I mean, there's, I don't have a crystal ball, but I, I love this so much that I don't, I don't spend my day being consumed by my worry about, are these companies going to produce an exit? And I think that's a key litmus test of being an investor because people give you their money and um, you have to be okay with the risk that you've taken on by managing their money. A hundred percent. And I, I think, you know, where that comes most prominently into play is that you applying the right uh, rigor and lens to the investment decision itself. And then once we're in, we're hundred percent in, we know there's going to be, you know, pivots, dips and turns along the way. We don't get panicked when that happens. We just re right size, reset, brainstorm, and then run as fast as we can. And it's okay. Like that's what, you know, bad news, better to know early than to know oftentimes too late. And so I, I totally agree. And I think, 
you know, with that said, I do feel a tremendous amount of responsibility, particularly given that our thesis is so location based that if we don't do a phenomenal job of returning that, you know, that, that ROI, hopefully multiple times over, that our thesis has failed and we're doing our whole ecosystem a disservice because it is hard enough to raise funding. It's hard to raise funding in areas outside the coast. It's even harder. And so like in order for it to be correct, we have to also do well. Right. And so, so it is that constant trade off of, you know, I'm getting this right. And, and it's, it's all part of the journey. Mm -hmm. Uh, I wanted to ask you both too, you know, like you were saying, Pam, Capital 3 is kind of in this one industry vertical, bread and butter has kind of these three industry verticals. Um, when you're, when you're looking at your potential, p potential portfolio companies, you know, what are you looking for and how are you looking for kind of to add diversity in terms of kind of industry and then gender and, and race, or are you looking more for um, connecting with, with the individual behind the business? So how do you kind of, um, assess who makes a good portfolio company. It's really funny because we only invest in companies that have a woman CEO. And I, I, I always have to laugh when I get these connections on LinkedIn from a man saying, my company looks like a good fit for you. <laughs> so it's like, you know, you expect these entrepreneurs to do a little bit of diligence when they reach out and when they right. don't. Uh, but anyway, so our number one, as I said earlier, we're investing in early, early stage. So pre-seed seed. So that's at the very earliest stages of the company formation. They might've been around for a couple years, but they haven't raised too much capital. Maybe they've raised a million or so. Um, so uh, women CEO, if it's not a woman CEO, we just sort of stop looking other than for, you know, general um, informational educational purposes for us about what's happening in the industry. Um, and then we, you know, health is this massive bucket, right? It's, it's a huge vertical. And so we did a lot of research on what are the emerging opportunities, especially where women are, um, are, are playing in those opportunities. And so one of them obviously was women's health. Women's health is, and children's health have been way underfunded um, historically, and that's starting to change. Um, digital health has been around, but there's lots of great things happening there. Digital health, digital therapeutics, genomics, microbiome um, is something that we're very, very interested in. And you can't not look at telehealth these days, obviously. Um, and uh, a variety of other areas where we felt there was really, really strong emerging opportunities and not saturated with, with tons of, of companies already having raised financing. So that's kind of a picture of, of where, where we start. Um, and then the other question was what, what makes a good portfolio company or? I or, think so. <laughs> I don't even know what I asked you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I, would, I would say for entrepreneurs, you know, there's, there's fit. And so always, I mean, it, it, can, it takes me a minute to figure out if a company's a fit for my fund. And so uh, because of the criteria that we're looking for now, you know, for, for firms that are investing in broader categories, it might, you know, maybe, maybe it takes more than that. But for us, it's, it's a very qu quick fit and then uh, fit or not fit with thesis. And then in terms of what makes a good portfolio company, number one, assuming they fit, number one is a really compelling CEO. Um, really, really compelling CEO that has either has really great experience in the realm where they are building the company or they can speak to the team that has the experience. I mean, then we look for companies where there's, it's very trued up in terms of here's what I say I'm going to do and what's required to scale this company. And here's what they've actually done. And that's often called traction or, you know, sort of evidence for the value proposition, but early stage companies, I mean, it's just, you know, it's, you're placing a bet on all these unknowns because there's no company history to evaluate or very little. So a lot of it has to do with the company's plans and their understanding of their plans and the evidence that they have that they can either meet those plans or pivot as needed, you know, as the world changes so they can make good on the money that we've invested in them. And from my point of view, you know, we kind of joke, but we say the things that we look for are team, 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 product and market. And, and those are the, the big five. And it par partially they be heavily indexing on team is that you're so early that it really is a bet on these founders, their vision, but really the ability of, you know, the idea itself may change, the product may change, but this is the team that we're backing first and foremost. Product, we tend to invest in uh, tech companies or, or tech enabled companies. It doesn't need to be a pure tech play, but really product driven first. Is it scalable? 
who owns the tech? Is what's the IP? Is it built in house? Kind of the product. And then I myself, I'm super obsessed with market. So understanding um, the size of the market, the slice of the market, but not just are you reorganizing the market and trying to take a slice from some incumbent player, but are you potentially blowing it wide open and bringing in new new players off the sidelines? And so that makes us really excited. And you know, my my partner Brett, one of the my favorite questions that he loves to ask companies is, you know, how are you going to take over the world? Um, but in seriousness, what is what is the vision there, and what does this ultimately? You know, when we're talking about venture style scale and venture style returns, how do you think about that? So, and then with, you know, once we've made the investment, great portfolio companies are those who are, trust us, very transparent, regular communication, make it easy for us to help you because we're all about that. So if you can help, you know, what's your, not just, can you help introduce me to customers, but here's a list of five and here's the specific teams I would love to reach. And here's a little blurb that you could forward helping with that um, proactive, great communication really makes for seamless relationship between the two of us. We're very quickly running out of time. This hour went so fast. Um, so I'll ask you both for any final thought and where's the best place for people to find out more um, about your firms? Well, for me, certainly they can look at our website um, and then there's been you know a few articles written on us. Uh, uh, so that would be one place. And then uh, you, Resources for venture capital or resources for startup, which, which. Um, I think if you had a great uh, resource that people can learn more about venture capital, that would be great. I have a book that I really like. Um, it's, um, where did I put this? It's called The Business of Venture Capital by Mahendra um, Ram, Ramzinghani. It's not a new book, but I found that to be really, really valuable. There's a ton of books out there, um, but but that's a good one um, that I like. So to, to learn more about Bread and Butter uh, or to connect with me, so we just, we have our newly launched website, breadandbutterventures.com. We have a medium channel that we're going to be posting to regularly. We've also posted our our commitments around diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as you know our, our transparent publishing of what the data looks like today within our portfolio, and then uh, I'm I'm super active on Twitter. I'm at Mary Grove. I love to hear from people. I love to message people back and connect there as well. So I would say, in terms of resources, I do love venture deals. Brad Fell's book, and I you know each each new edition they come out with has different anecdotes, and they're all super valuable. So. Yes, but closing thought is, you know, really, really appreciate this opportunity to come together with both of you and to, you know, de demystify the industry a little bit, but really encourage everybody who's thinking about becoming an entrepreneur and approaching, you know, venture capitalists, please don't be intimidated. It's, it's truly not as, uh, as uh, you know, shrouded in secrecy as people think it is. And there are people uh, like Pam like me and, and our whole community is really, really open and really want to help bring everybody along with us for this journey. So we hope they'll reach out, learn more. And, and again, the Forge North blog with more updates on when our future events will be. Well, and just congrats, Mary, on Bread and Butter. That's a super, super awesome development for our community. Thanks, Pam. Uh, and thank you, Amanda, for everything that you do. Um, for a whole variety of communities and all your work at Collider Foundation. Thanks for bringing us together for this. This was awesome. Well, thanks so much to both of you for doing this. I really appreciate uh, your time this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. Thanks so much to Pam and Mary for being on the podcast today, sharing their stories and their insights about the venture capital space. You can check out more about Bread and Butter Ventures and Capita 3 from the links in our show notes. I wanted to let everyone know as well about an event that's coming up shortly at Collider called Collider Spark with Natalie Nixon. This is going to take place on Thursday, August 13th from 3 to 4 p.m. virtually. This is the first Collider Spark series. And a little bit about Natalie Nixon. She's a creativity strategist and president of Figure Eight Thinking. She advises and emboldens leaders to transform their businesses through a creativity and foresight. She's a regular contributor to Inc. and the editor of Strategic Design Thinking. She's a global speaker whose roster includes TEDx Philadelphia, CUPS Conference, the Business Innovation Factory, SEB Group, 360 Possibles, Creative Mornings, among more. 
She holds a PhD in design management, an MS in global textile marketing, and a BA in anthropology and Africana studies. She's also the author of The Creative Leap, Unleash Curiosity, Improvisation, and Intuition at Work. So join us for this Collider Spark series. You can find your tickets for this Zoom event on Collider's Facebook page. So check it out. It'll take place Thursday, August 13th from 3 to 4. You can find more information and register on Collider's Facebook page. Be sure to also check out more stories of Rochester entrepreneurs on our website at rochesterrising.org, where we have lots of other article and podcast content. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. All right, that's a wrap for our podcast today. Be sure to subscribe so that you never miss a story of entrepreneurship and innovation coming out of Rochester, Minnesota. We'll be here next week with a brand new episode. Thank you.